Nagato Kimura was in his office at the local fish cannery as a 30-foot high wall of water raced toward him. Moments later, the port city of Ashinomaki, Japan, was utterly devastated. He was able to escape along with his workers, but his factory that his father had founded was completely destroyed. Now, workers that were combing through the rubble started to notice these tiny little tins of fish that were all dotted along the landscape. People in Tokyo heard about this, and they decided to help out. So they traveled up to Tokyo, where they gathered up the cans, they cleaned them, and they washed them, and they returned them to sell. There's only one problem. How do you sell something with no label? Because the labels have been washed away. With no other choice, they stacked the cans on the shelves bare. And then something happened. People began coming into the stores and decorating them with messages of hope, love, and support, and compassion, like this one that says, help each other, Japan. As I ate canned mackerel with Kimura-san, he told me how ordinary people had helped recover 800,000 cans to rebuild their factory. Now, 5,000 miles away, Orrin Bardur Johnson is a new committee member of the Icelandic government. Bankers there inflated a financial bubble that wrecked the national economy. In order to repair the public's trust, he and his partners worked together with citizens to collaborate, build consensus, and work together toward crowdsourcing a new constitution. So here you have two island nations, two places where people took to the streets in rage and protest over catastrophes. And yet the ultimate resolution to crisis came from the opposite of anger. There's a fundamental shift today in the role of masculine and feminine values. We live in a world that's increasingly social, interdependent, and transparent. And in this world, feminine values are ascendant. Because the most innovative among us are breaking away from traditional structures to be more flexible, more collaborative, and nurturing. They're following the Athena doctrine, named after the Greek goddess whose strength came from her wisdom and fairness. All over the world, men and women are deploying these strengths to make their lives in the world better. Michael D'Antonio, my co-author, and I surveyed 64,000 people in 13 countries across a wide swath of cultural, political, and economic diversity. We gathered data from Canada to Chile and from Mexico to Indonesia. We also traveled nearly four times around the world talking to people everywhere. We spent time in the favelas of Peru and in villages in northern India. We talked to NGOs in Africa, schools in Sweden. We actually interviewed world political leaders in Brussels and Jerusalem. And we even went to the tiny kingdom of Bhutan where we met the secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission. <laughs> and everywhere we went, we asked people a lot of questions about life today, about what makes us happy and gives our lives meaning. And people talk today as if they live in an age of extended anxiety. Many are worried that their children won't have a future as bright as their own. They're concerned about whether there's too much power in corporations. They're also worried about overall empathy of their leaders in their countries. And lastly, they're fundamentally concerned about whether or not there's basic fairness in society. And when we look at the underlying pinnings, we actually see that there's a global referendum on men. In fact, the majority of people around the world are dissatisfied with the conduct of men, including 79% of people <laughs> in Japan and South Korea, and two-thirds of people in the US, Indonesia, and Mexico. Now, what's interesting about this data is that Canadian men must be doing something right. <laughs> and as a researcher, they really throw off my averages, or I'd have a much better story to tell you. But what's interesting to me is millennials. Again, what we see with millennials, they have a fundamentally stronger appreciation of women and their role in society. Nearly 3 quarters of millennials around the world are dissatisfied with masculine structures. And we think what's behind this is increasingly people are frustrated by codes of male conduct and behavior, codes of control and aggression and black and white thinking that have led to many of the problems we face today, from wars and income inequality to reckless risk taking and scandal. In fact, two-thirds of people around the world think the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. <laughs> Including the majority of people in the US, the UK, the France, France, Brazil, um, France, Brazil, and Germany. And so another really interesting aspect of this data also is the fact that you look at millennials again even in very masculine structure, uh, masculine societies like Germany, 
China, Japan, South Korea, you have millennials be responding to this question even more strongly than women. Okay, so how would the world be a better place if men thought more like women? What does thinking like a woman mean? This is an obvious challenge for me in that I'm not a woman. <laughs> Although Michael and I are husbands and fathers in all female households, this hardly qualifies as empirical research. So what we needed to do is understand more about masculine and feminine traits and find a definable way to measure them and then get the public's attitude about those traits. So we conducted two separate studies. In the first study, we asked 32,000 people around the world, half of our sample, to classify 125 different human traits as either masculine, feminine, or neither. Then in the other half of our sample, with no gendering, we asked them to rate those traits again on leadership, success, morality, and happiness, the very things that people said were in crisis today. And so by statistically modeling the relationship between these two data sets, we could start to understand how masculine and feminine traits relating to solving today's challenges. So overall, we found strong consistency on what people think is masculine and feminine, and that feminine values are indeed ascendant. Let's look at one example. We see that the essence of modern leadership is now feminine. People around the world are looking for a more expressive style of leader who shares their feelings more open and honestly, as well as patience and reason to break gridlock and get things done. Now the masculine values of sort of decisiveness and resilience are still important, but when you look at it in the context of flexibility and collaboration and sharing credit, people want those values as well and those are feminine. Now the other really interesting thing we saw in our data is that the definition of winning is now plural. So the idea of aggression, aggression and independence far trails the ideas of collaboration and working together. Also we start to see that being loyal, which is feminine, is more important than being proud, which is masculine, which speaks to the very reasons of why our leaders are leading in the first place. What are they signing up for, for themselves or for the greater good? We saw this data repeat itself when we looked at questions around morality and questions around happiness. And in fact, even when we looked across the data, we started to see an overall shift in the favor of feminine values looking at things everywhere from the importance of happiness over money, culture, success, and collaboration. So let's look at some of the examples of some of the people we met. I have 80 interviews, but I'm gonna share just a few with you briefly. Dr. Ayad Maddish is a scientist whose vulnerability is reshaping science. As he told me, he kept getting stuck in his experiments. And when he went to his peers for help, he learned that it's taboo to show weakness and say you don't know something. So he started ResearchGate. It's the first social network for scientists. Already, Ayad has assembled 2 million members in 200 countries. I also spent time with Leo Risky. He is a cultural attache at the Felicis, which is Danish for house for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first shared embassy in the world, home to the five Nordic nations of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. The entire model of this 21st century diplomacy is about setting aside cultural differences and working together for the common good. I couldn't help but notice as I got done speaking with Leo that directly across the street is the Syrian embassy. <laughs> Also spent time with Catalina Coduque. She's doing amazing work as an NGO in Medellin. In Colombia, the results of a lot of women who've run NGOs there have reduced the level of rebels. There's 32,000 ex-rebels that have laid down their arms to live in Casa de Paz or peace houses. Her programs are working together to get former soldiers to live with victims that they actually once terrorized. Her programs are around redemption, empathy, and respect. We also spent time with Emily Bolton from Social Finance. I think social impact bonds are very interesting. These are ways in which desirable social outcomes lower future government costs for private investors. Here in one instance, she told us about how the importance of reducing rates of reoffending prisoners would actually reward investors. What happens is investors get involved in that and actually assist in job retraining and counseling. We also spent time with Robert Collymore, CEO of Safaricom. Kenya may be possibly the most wirelessly connected place on Earth. Roughly 20% of the entire Kenyan economy flows through text-based platforms on M-Pesa. 
which Robert is now using to aid health agencies and NGOs to get vouchers to people in need to avoid corruption. Then we spent time in the British countryside with Granny Holly. She's one of the platoons of grandmothers that sew hand-knitted scarves for focusing on hope and wisdom for young people. Granny Zinc is really awesome because not only do you get to go onto the website, but you can pick out your own granny. <laughs> True to their life, their slogan is there's wisdom in the wool. Now, when we go back to our data, what we see is that the more developed an economy, the more likely that country is to incorporate both feminine and masculine values. In this tract with our research, 80% of people said that man or woman, you need both masculine and feminine traits to thrive in today's world. But that also brings us on to another point. Our gender is who we are, not what we can be. We should all be sharing these traits. So our story really builds out to look at what happens when you go beyond economic progress. You actually see that incorporating feminine values actually relates not only to higher economic development, but greater quality of life. We're going to go back then and look at Japan and talk briefly about Yamaguchi-san. She was basically bullied so badly in school that she had to leave. But she then came back and got a fashion degree. And one day, she went onto Yahoo and typed in, what's the poorest country in Asia, and discovered it was Bangladesh. She leased a factory in Dhaka, and a company of all men, she taught them how to make hand-quality leather garments and bags. Today, this program has become so successful that they are paid double the wages in Bangladesh. So for this process, for me, it's been an incredible experience meeting all these amazing men and women. I think a couple of things in conclusion. Number one, the best way to advocate for women and girls around the world is to have men model their approach. We must realize that feminine values don't belong to one gender. They're inside us all. And they're a critical form of innovation for navigating the future. Femininity is the operating system of 21st century progress. And women and men who can think like them are going to create a world we'll all want to inhabit. Thank you.